Welcome to the sixth video lecture of the Lithography Tool Package Training at DTU Nanolab. This lecture is a brief introduction to some of the process steps that often takes place after the lithography is finished. After completing the development step, small resist residues may be left on the substrate surface. This residue is known as scum. Scumming is thought to come from the resist which have been dissolved in the development process. Small amounts of the dissolved resist may precipitate out of solution and reattach to the substrate surface. It is essentially impossible to fully avoid. Problems with scum can increase development time or prevent proper development, especially of the resist in corners between substrate and resist. Scumming is often a problem for lift off processes. A very common method for removing scum, also known as de-scumming, is a short, low-power, oxygen plasma. Sometimes it can be beneficial to make the resist film harder than what is normally used. This is done by baking it at higher temperatures in a process called hard baking. Hard baking is often used when the resist is going to be used as a barrier layer, or when the pattern resist is used as the masking material in etching processes. In that case the hard baking is done after finishing the lithography, but before any pattern transfer takes place. Hard baking improves mechanical durability of the resist. It also improves the chemical resistance and how well the resist adheres to the substrate. Unfortunately this also comes at the cost of being much more difficult to remove, especially when using wet chemical resist stripping. Hard baking is done by baking the substrate on a hot plate, or in an oven, at temperatures between 120 to 150 degrees Celsius. The specific temperature will be resist and process dependent. When the pattern transfer is complete, or if there is some kind of problem with the lithography, it is necessary to remove the resist film from the substrate. If multiple lithography steps are needed, the resist is removed before the next step. Resist masks are usually only used for transferring a single pattern layer. A very commonly used method for resist stripping is a longer, high-power, oxygen plasma. Another common method is wet etching of the resist, using an appropriate solvent, and sometimes also ultrasonic agitation. Etching is one of the most used ways of transferring the resist pattern into the substrate. Sometimes the pattern is etched directly into the bulk substrate, and other times the pattern is etched into a hard surface layer in order to create what is known as a hard mask. Hard masks are used for etching processes which the resist mask would not be durable enough to withstand. We divide etching into two main categories, wet etching and dry etching. The wet etching uses liquid etching chemicals. The temperature affects the etch rate. Many wet etching processes take place at elevated temperatures. Wet etching is isotropic, although some materials, like crystalline silicon, behaves anisotropic due to the different crystal planes having different etching rates. A dry etch, on the other hand, uses some kind of gas, instead of a liquid, as etching medium, and typically takes place in a vacuum chamber. Some dry etching processes also convert the gas into a plasma, and are then using what is known as reactive ion etching. Dry etching can be isotropic or anisotropic. Reactive ion etching is covered in detail in the dry etch TPT, so we will not go into details about that process here. Unremoved scumming on the substrate leads to micro-masking and increased surface roughness. This is mostly the case when dry etching as some wet etching processes can re-dissolve the resist residue into solution. Lift-off is another very common pattern transfer method. After developing the resist pattern, a metal film is deposited on the substrate, covering the entire surface. This is followed by lifting off the resist mask. This is the same as removing the resist mask, and is where the process gets its name from. The metal film that was on top of the resist mask is lifted together with the resist, but the metal attached directly to the substrate surface remains on the substrate. The pattern left on the substrate is a copy of the resist mask pattern, which in turn was a copy of the shadow mask pattern. The best lift-off results are achieved when using resist with negative sloped sidewalls. 
This is because the negative sloped sidewall prevents the metal film to deposit on the surface as a conformal coating. It will instead deposit as broken areas of metal film, which is much easier to lift properly. Unremoved scumming on the substrate leads to poor adhesion of the metal and micro bridging. Micro bridging is when the tiny scumming particles connect adjacent features and will often cause the entire device to fail. The lifting is done in a solvent bath with added ultrasonic agitation. Pattern ion implantation can be done using the resist pattern as mask. This will add selective areas of doping to the substrate. Ion implantation is done by accelerating ions into the substrate. The resist will absorb the implantation in the unopened areas of the mask. This method allows for either positive or negative doping of the substrate. A film can also be grown on the substrate using electroplating. Electroplating is a wet process where the entire substrate is submerged into a bath. It requires that the substrate is conductive or has a conductive seed layer on it. The resist mask prevents metal film growth on the masked areas. Unremoved scumming on the substrate leads to partial film growth. In order to determine the thickness and optical constants of the resist film, or other optically transparent films such as nitrides and oxides, we can use non-contact reflectometer tools. At DTU Nanolab we have a reflectometer, which measures film thicknesses from 10 nanometer up to 250 micrometers. We also have an ellipsometer, which measures film thicknesses from 2 nanometer up to 10 micrometers. The film thickness can also be measured using profilometers. As the name suggests, profilometers measures the surface profile. To measure the film thickness, it requires that the full thickness has been opened up. Profilometers are also used for characterizing the surface topography. An example of a feature which could be investigated is this paraboloid shape. At DTU Nanolab we have multiple mechanical profilometers, which measures the surface of the substrate by dragging a physical probe across the substrate surface. This creates a two-dimensional profile of the measured line. A three-dimensional profile can be made by stitching together multiple 2D line scans. If we scan the paraboloid shape, we would get a result like this. We also have optical profilers, which creates a three-dimensional profile using optical interferometry in a non-contact measurement. If we scan the same paraboloid shape, we would get a result like this. Atomic force microscopy is one of many types of scanning probe microscopy. It is used for characterization of the surface roughness and topology of the sample. It is somewhat similar to a mechanical profilometer, as it measures the surface using a small mechanical probe. Unlike the profilometer though, it is often used in a non-contact mode, where the measured quantity is actually the weak atomic force interactions between the surface and the probe tip. The AFM creates a three-dimensional image by stitching together many two-dimensional line scans. It is mostly used for measuring sub-micron topological features. Scanning electron microscopy is a very popular characterization method, both due to its ability to inspect the smallest features, but also for its ability to produce great-looking images for documentation. It is used for characterization of pattern dimensions, and can also be used for viewing the resist profile, but typically requires that the substrate is either broken, or at least tilted inside the vacuum chamber. The scanning electron microscope is covered in great detail by the SEMTPT, so we will not go into details about that characterization method here. The final characterization method we will cover in this lecture is optical microscopy. It uses visible light for inspection of the substrate and is a very quick method for checking pattern dimensions as well as overall lithography quality. Optical microscopy also produces great looking images for documentation. Many processes in the clean room requires tools other than the lithography tools and DTU Nanolab has several other tool package training courses available for users. The SEM TPT includes theory about SEM, 
as well as training in instrument operation. The course is for all users who intend to perform any kind of SEM-related process and is a prerequisite for training in any of the SEM. The dry etch TPT includes theory on dry etching and equipment, as well as training in equipment operation in the clean room. The course is for all users who intend to perform any kind of dry etching in the clean room, and is a prerequisite for training in any of the dry etch equipment. The thin film TPT is a theoretical course introducing the thin film growth and deposition techniques available at DTU Nanolab. The course consists of two lectures and is mandatory for users that wants to use any thin film growth or deposition tools in the clean room. This concludes the sixth and final lecture in the lithography TPT. When you have completed all six quizzes, you are eligible for the online equipment training for the lithography tools required for your process.